on September 14, 2022, the Taiwan Policy Act advanced to the floor of the US Senate. The bill will upgrade bilateral ties between Washington and Taipei. This includes interoperable security arrangements, trade links and people-to-people -people ties. But the bill goes further, using values-based rhetoric to spell out Washington's Indo-Pacific strategy in unusual detail. In it, Taiwan is granted a starring role and is described as fundamental to the United States' interests and values. Such lofty rhetoric may appear odd given that Washington does not officially recognize the Taipei government. But formal arrangements often play second fiddle to the facts on the ground. And from a strategic perspective, Taiwan is the key that unlocks the Indo-Pacific. Beyond its crucial location, Taiwan is an economic hub and a center for technological innovation. The island's importance was recently highlighted when US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited earlier this year, sparking a fresh round of confrontation. So what exactly is at stake and how does Taiwan hold the key to the regional balance of power? Today's video was sponsored by Ground News, a comparative news platform I use to get a more nuanced perspective on global issues. Ground News helps expose bias and blind spots in news coverage. I'm a big advocate of the app and website, so check it out as a resource and subscribe now for 15% off for Caspian viewers only. Let me show you how it works. China has beefed up its military drills near Taiwan following Nancy Pelosi's visit as a deterrence, the US is now weighing options for a sanctions package, but what I find interesting is the story behind the story. While the bias distribution is about evenly spread, the ownership of the sources is what I find striking. Only 17% of the nearly 50 articles belong to independent news outlets, while 20% belong to government-funded sources and 27% are part of media conglomerates. So, nearly half of the sources covering this story are pretty much monopolized. This just goes to show you how governments, even democratically elected ones, can steer media coverage. It's these tools made available by Ground News that give me a more nuanced perspective. Ground News is supported by their subscribers. To stay informed on issues all over the world, go to ground.news slash Caspian and subscribe for unlimited access for less than $1 a month and support a small team of media outsiders working to make the news more transparent. Though Beijing claims Taiwan has belonged to it since ancient times, the island's strategic relevance is a more recent phenomenon. For most of its history, the Middle Kingdom's chief concern was its land power and defenses. The Great Wall of China blocked raiders from charging over the steppes, and the Silk Road formed a trade corridor, allowing Chinese merchants to trade silk for silver with their Roman counterparts. For much of history, no one cared much for Taiwan. The island and its indigenous peoples lived an isolated existence, largely free from the corrupting influence of great power politics. It was only in the 16th century that Portuguese sailors sighted the island, naming it Ilha Formosa, Portuguese for beautiful isle. Yet the island was far from beautiful, its mountainous interior and malarial plains meant its usefulness lay in its status as a colonial trading post. Ironically, it was Taiwan's colonization by Spanish and Dutch forces that alerted Beijing to the island's importance. Control over the island became crucial to Chinese interests. Not only would this prevent attacks and unwanted interference in Chinese markets by outsiders, but it would also deprive rebels of a safe haven from the centralized power of the mainland. Taiwan was like a gateway that granted faraway naval powerhouses access to the Chinese heartland. After the Ming Dynasty collapsed in 1644, loyalists rebelled against China's new Manchu leaders. A preeminent leader of the resistance was named Coxinya, 
who mounted successful attacks against the Manchus along the Chinese coast. But after a major defeat at Nanjing in 1659, Coxing fled to Taiwan. There, he employed his martial prowess against Dutch colonists, defeating them in 1661. Even so, there was no let-up from the Qing hegemony. And in 1863, Beijing dispatched 300 warships, defeating Coxing Ya's troops and incorporating Taiwan into the Qing Empire. But Beijing's control was not to last. Decades later, the Japanese Empire conquered Taiwan in 1895, retaining control until the end of World War II. Yet, the end of Japanese occupation only reopened the civil war on the mainland between Mao Zedong's communist forces and Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang. And despite American economic and military support, Jiang's forces were eventually forced to quit the mainland in 1949, retreating across the Taiwan Strait. Viewing the communist takeover of China as inevitable, Washington incorporated Taiwan into its anti-communist maritime containment strategy. It was hoped that the Taipei government would provide a crucial link in a chain that ran from the Aleutian Islands to the Philippines to the Indonesian archipelago. In this containment strategy, Taiwan sat at the very center. So when Washington and Beijing found themselves on opposite sides of the Korean War, America secured Taiwan as an ally. Nevertheless, circumstances eventually drove China and the United States to revise their relationship. Tensions in Sino-Soviet relations gave Washington an opening to engage Beijing. The Nixon administration, reeling from defeat in the Vietnam War, wanted to normalize relations. And in the Shanghai Communique of 1972, acknowledged that all Chinese on both sides of the strait maintain there is but one China and that Taiwan is part of it. This diplomatic fence-sitting was codified in the Taiwan Relations Act of 1979 where the Carter administration recognized the Beijing government. Thus, Washington placed an each-way bet on the Taiwan issue. Even though it does not recognize Taiwanese independence, on a practical level, American policymakers seek to deter Beijing's attempts at reunification. This includes extensive arms sales and military training programs. Meanwhile, high-profile congressional lawmakers like Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi have visited the island to play up their national security credentials. Understandably, this arrangement has frustrated Beijing, which insists Washington follow the joint communique in word and deed. The communist leadership in Beijing cannot realistically compromise on this issue. They've publicly and loudly pledged to reunify China. Any backsliding on Taiwan would be fatal to the Communist Party's legitimacy. Beyond this, the presence of a hostile state just off its shores is a dagger pointed at the heart of Chinese interests. In addition to being a staging ground for a potential naval attack, US military weapons and other suppliers have made the Taiwanese military a small but capable force. Still more, Taiwan is home to strategically vital industries. This is particularly true of semiconductors, which are crucial to emerging 5G technologies, the Internet of Things and automation. The Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company alone had a 54% market share in the semiconductor foundry business in early 2022. 65% of the world's semiconductors and 9 tenths of most advanced chips are made on the island. That is nothing short of impressive. Under American patronage, Taipei leveraged its low labor costs and proximity to the Chinese mainland to specialize in semiconductors. The plan paid off as Taiwan became the global leader in microchip manufacturing, and this accounted for 30% of Taiwan's 2019 exports and 17% of its total GDP. But as Taiwan accumulated more wealth, civilian wages also went up. This pushed Taiwanese firms to outsource labor-intensive processes to the Chinese mainland. 
Fujian, across the Strait of Taiwan, owes the development of its manufacturing industry to Taiwanese capital investment and trade. There was a natural synergy, as most Taiwanese are descended from the Fujian region and speak similar dialects of Chinese. By 2019, nearly 90% of Taiwan's information and communication technology related products were being manufactured in China. And yet, Taiwan's semiconductor prowess is a double edged sword. Given the geopolitical volatility, the United States is pouring billions into supporting domestic chip makers like Intel, while China is doing the same with companies like Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation. Long term, such developments will only cut away at Taiwan's market share in chip making. Over time, this will only drive Taiwan away from China's orbit and make it more dependent on the United States. For the moment though, economic interdependence confines aggression to grey zones. Tactics like saber rattling, military exercises, scrambling fighter jets and other cost imposition measures are designed to drain military resources. For comparison, in 2017 only two Chinese naval vessels entered Taiwanese waters. But that number jumped to 600 in 2019 and nearly 4,000 in 2020. Also, in 2020, Taiwan scrambled its air force nearly 3,000 times as a result of Chinese incursions, which cost Taiwanese taxpayers a whopping $900 million in fuel, wear and tear, and pilot fatigue. Without firing a single shot, China is depleting Taiwan's resources. Disproportionate stress is a deadly effective means of negotiation. But fortunately for Taiwan, having Washington as an ally makes all the difference. Even if tensions between American-backed security and Chinese-backed prosperity persist, they will likely be resolved in the former's favor. Wealth is great, but it has no value without the means to secure it. When faced between a choice between guns and money, it is better to arm oneself, because those who pick wealth over security will soon be left with neither. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Special thanks to Jacob Shapiro for researching and writing this paper. To learn more about Jacob's work and his platform Cognitive Investments, visit www.cognitive.investments. In any case, thank you for your time and savol. So